Hello, my name is Ann Wright and I'm with Veterans for Peace here in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, today we're joined by a great guest. We have our national president of Veterans for Peace who will be telling us about uh, a remarkable historic event coming in that will complement and will have a, a great deal to do with uh, the struggles we have in Hawaii and particularly the struggles against militarization of our islands and particularly with coming up with the massive, massive naval exercises that will be coming in the summer of 2018, the RIMPAC uh, naval exercises. So we are pleased to have Jerry Condon, the National President of Veterans for Peace, with us here in Hawaii. Jerry, we'd like to ask you about uh, the national projects of Veterans for Peace and what this organization does. Sure. Well, Veterans for Peace is a 33-year-old organization. Um, we have chapters in over 100 U.S. cities, and we're actually becoming an international organization now with chapters in London and Ireland and Okinawa and Japan, South Korea, and um, even uh, Tijuana, Mexico, Vietnam. Um, we are uh, dedicated to nothing less than abolishing war as an instrument of, of our foreign policy. And uh, we do a lot of work to educate people about the cost of war, the human costs, the financial costs, the environmental destruction that results from war and U.S. military bases. Over 800 U.S. military bases in over 80 countries around the world right now. Certainly a lot of military right here in Hawaii that I've been discovering. Uh, we also uh, fight for justice for uh, veterans and victims of war. For example, uh, we have a bill in Congress we're supporting that would um, provide relief and care for uh, both veterans and Vietnamese who suffer the consequences of Agent Orange poisoning, dioxin poisoning. Uh, still a huge problem in Vietnam and for many Vietnam veterans. Uh, we uh, work to restrain our government from intervening, whether overtly or covertly, um, in uh, the internal affairs of other nations. So that keeps us very busy because we have you know, permanent wars going on in too many countries right now, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and beyond. There's rumors of uh, uh, a military coup brewing in Venezuela. Okay. And, uh, and of course, uh, we're really concerned about the uh, threats of nuclear war with North Korea. Um, so we have a, a famous uh, historic uh, anti-nuclear sailboat. It's the National Project of Veterans for Peace that was here in Honolulu in 1958, 59 years ago. Um, the crew was on their way, it was led by a U.S. Navy captain, um, a crew of Quaker peace activists were on their way to the Marshall Islands to interfere with U.S. nuclear testing. When they were stopped here in Honolulu by the Coast Guard, they were arrested, they went to jail, but they got brought international attention to the whole issue of uh, nuclear testing and the radiation that was floating around the globe, built support for the 1963 Partial Test Ban Treaty that was signed by the U.S., the U.K., and the USSR. And uh, now that boat, is, uh, which was discovered a few years ago underwater in Humboldt Bay in Northern California, has been rebuilt by Veterans for Peace, Quakers, and other boat lovers. It's now once again sailing for a nuclear-free world and a peaceful, sustainable future. Jerry, please tell us about the arrival of the historic anti-nuclear ship, the uh, Golden Rule, and how that relates to us here in Hawaii and in the struggles throughout the Pacific Islands. Well, we're learning a lot about these struggles. Of course, we also have uh, uh, delegations that we send to Jeju Island, South Korea, to Okinawa, to, to join with the local resistance there. And what's to, going on in those of, islands? Well, the U.S. is expanding military bases and uh, destroying the natural environment, destroying communities, violating sovereignty rights. And uh, so that picture is uh, here in Hawaii also and uh, all throughout the Pacific Islands. So we're definitely uh, intending, while we're sailing for a nuclear-free future, we want to unite with all those uh, local and national struggles against uh, the militarization of the islands and uh, against the uh, sovereignty rights of the, of the residents of those islands. Indeed, and there, there are other islands that we forgot to mention on this part of it. I mean, we, not only do we have 
uh, the Marshall Islands, but uh, the island of Guam mm -hmm. that uh, now has uh, uh, an increased amount of U.S. military going on to it, uh, it uh, one third of the island being a part of it. Uh, are you planning on going to Guam? Yes, we're going to uh, we're going to spend several months uh, in the Hawaiian Islands, and then we're going to go on to the Marshall Islands and to Guam and the Marianas, and then on to Okinawa and uh, probably South Korea as well, Jeju Island, and, and uh, we want to be in Japan in 2020 for the tw uh, 75th anniversary of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, nuclear bombings by the U.S. So uh, we're going to be making a lot of connections along the way, and we're already finding a lot of people right here in Hawaii who have connections to all those islands, and those are definitely interconnected struggles, but I hear people saying how they want them to be even more so and make a stronger force if the Golden Rule can play a small role in, in, in helping to strengthen and uniting those struggles, we'll be very happy. Now, are you going to be working with uh, groups here on Oahu and other Hawaiian islands, for example, uh, some of the high schools and the voyaging societies? Yes, yes we're, we're reaching out to the voyaging society and, and other traditional uh, sailors, and uh, we're going to be uh, having programs for youth, including indigenous youth. We want to take people out sailing on the Golden Rule. We want to teach people how to sail and teach people about uh, some of the uh, nonviolent direct action that we're learning about and uh, also uh, nuclear issues and seeing how all these issues connect, which they certainly do. And learning from all of these people too. I believe you mentioned that you're looking for some Hawaiian sailors uh, who can teach us uh, uh, about right. sailing in these waters. Right, we need local knowledge and uh, we definitely uh, need some experienced Hawaiian sailors, uh, so that's going to be very important to us. And you're right, we're going to be learning a lot. I'm a, I've been in Hawaii a little over a week, it's my first time here, and I'm just learning so much I, that I had no idea quite the extent of what was going on here. And uh, so we hope that as the Golden Rule sails to all these islands and unites with all these struggles, We'll be able to share that through our media, through Veterans for Peace, uh, with thousands of people on the mainland and around the world. Uh -huh. Well, we look forward to the Golden Rule coming to uh, Oahu and sailing on to what, what other islands uh, have you already made contact with here? Well, I've been over on the Big Island. They're definitely expecting us over there in Hilo. I've been to uh, Maui. We're going to be going to Maui. We're going to be going to several other islands, including Kauai yeah. and Molokai. Yes, and even the island that the U.S. bombed for so many years. And Ku'ulabi, to yes. get permission from the native Hawaiians to be on Ku'ulabi to acknowledge the struggle that has gone there against the uh, militarization of uh, the, the, the sovereign uh, territory, uh, the sovereign nation, kingdom mm -hmm. of Hawaii, and uh, uh, to remind people around the world that the United States uh, stole this land uh, over 110 years right. ago. Right, and thanks to you, Anne, and to the uh, Honolulu chapter of Veterans for Peace, which I know is helping us make all these connections and is going to be uh, establishing a big committee to, uh, to welcome the Golden Rule when we arrive here in late Ju June, early July. Well, thank you very much for being here, Jerry. We really appreciate uh, you being here as the National President of Veterans for Peace and connecting the struggles that we have here in Hawaii with all the other Pacific Islands and for the ship, the Golden Rule, the historic anti-nuclear ship to be sailing from Hawaii, the uh, islands in Hawaii, through the Marshall Islands, Guam, Okinawa, and arriving in Japan in time for the commemoration of the horrible 75th year uh, that that nuclear bomb or atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And we are so thrilled to have Jerry Condon as our national president here to tell you about a wonderful project to educate us all about the dangers of nuclear weapons. So let me introduce Jerry Condon. follow a colonel and I was a an army private okay? <laughs> uh, back during the Vietnam uh, War and fortunately for me I didn't go to that war in fact I refused orders to fight in Vietnam after talking to a lot of returning veterans who told me some horrible stories about things that were happening over there so that's a whole other long story uh, Veterans for Peace actually is a 33 year old organization 
And most of our members are actually uh, Vietnam combat veterans. Uh, we also have World War II veterans. We have a few of those left. I have uh, veterans of the Korean War, and we have uh, veterans of more recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we're becoming a younger and more diverse organization. We have uh, uh, about 3,000 members right now, and chapters in over 100 U.S. cities. In the last few years, we've become an international organization. So we now have uh, some really great uh, chapters in uh, London, England, in Ireland, in Okinawa, in South Korea, and uh, our most recent chapter is actually in Japan. Um, we have a, a chapter of uh, expatriate Vietnam veterans, that's, that's U.S. veterans living in Vietnam, so they have an expatriate chapter in Vietnam. And they're working uh, with the Vietnamese uh, to help uh, resolve the problem of unexploded, or unexploded ordinance in Vietnam. I understand you have that problem in pretty in this neighborhood too. And uh, so there's still, all these years after the war, there's still people getting their kids, getting their limbs blown off and whatnot. It's, it's a serious problem. They do a lot of education in the schools, just teaching people what not to pick up and where not to go. But they also go out and, and when they locate these bombs, uh, uh, they send a team out to try to remove them. Sometimes they, they have to explode them in the safest way possible. It's a pretty dangerous job occasionally. In fact, one of the people, Vietnamese, who was doing that work was killed last year. Um, but uh, we're happy, we're proud that some of our Vietnam veterans are taking responsibility for that work in Vietnam. Um, and uh, our mission is uh, to uh, abolish war. We have a big, very bold mission. We, we, we think that uh, war is, uh, is anachro an anachronism. That is, it's no longer useful in this world, and especially with the firepower that exists in the world today. So we're, we're uh, opposed to, to uh, the U.S. Uh, intervening either overtly or, co or covertly in the internal affairs of other nations. You know, of course, we believe in the legitimate defensive purpose of the military, uh, but we haven't really seen any serious threats, I don't think, against the United States in some time. Uh, and uh, we also are, of course, opposed to nuclear weapons, abolishing nuclear weapons. So we're really happy that this boat here, the, the Golden Rule, historic Golden Rule sailboat, which I'm about to tell you the story of, is now a project of Veterans for Peace. And I'm going to get a slideshow here. And this is what the boat looks like today. And uh, it's got quite a history about it. And that history relates to right here in, in Honolulu. Let's see if I remember how to work this. OK. That's our contact information. Um, a little bit about Veterans for Peace. OK, this is the original crew. In 1958, this boat was sailed from Los Angeles to Honolulu on its way to the Marshall Islands uh, to uh, interfere with U.S. nuclear testing, bomb testing that was going on at the time. It was, uh, these are four Quaker peace activists led by a ca Captain Albert Bigelow. Bigelow was the driving force behind the Golden Rule. He was a naval officer during World War II. Um, he was uh, captain in a destroyer escort uh, from San Diego to Pearl Harbor when he heard about the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. And uh, he says, that's when I realized for the first time that morally war is impossible. He resigned his commission a month before he was eligible for a full pension. So he felt very strongly about it. He became involved with the Quakers, or a traditional uh, pacifist-oriented uh, group. and. Uh, they took, some of them were taken in the Hiroshima maidens at the time. These are young girls who were disfigured by the atomic bomb explosion uh, in Hiroshima. And some of the, sh some U.S. doctors, along with the support of the Quakers, were bringing them to, some of them to the United States for plastic surgery. And they stayed with uh, Bigelow, some of them stayed with Bert Bigelow's family. So he got to know these young girls. And so he was very dedicated to, uh, ending uh, the uh, nuclear tests and ending nuclear weapons and war. Shigeko Sasamori, this woman here, 
this also a pointer? No. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It is. Got a point. Is that red right? Button. The red button up here, like. <laughs> Where yet? Oh, there we go. So uh, Higeko Sasamori uh, was one of those Hiroshima maidens, and she actually was uh, at the splashdown uh, of the relaunched, uh, rebuilt Golden Rule in 2015 up in Eureka, California. I'll tell a little, a little more about that. So. Uh, this was the huge, a picture of the huge Castle Bravo nuclear test. Uh, took place on March 1st, 1954 on uh, Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. Uh, it was a 15 megaton device, thousand uh, times more powerful than uh, the Hiroshima blast. Um, so the, both the UK and that is uh, United Kingdom, uh, Great Britain, the USSR, the Soviet Union, and the US we're all testing atmospheric nuclear bombs at that time. So there's a whole lot of radiation floating all around the, the globe, and it's very poisonous stuff. The strontium-90 was being found, which is a, a, a product of nuclear explosions, was being found in cow's milk and mother's milk, and uh, this, this, uh, the famous uh, pediatrician, Dr. Spock, was, uh, Benjamin Spock, was uh, bringing people's attention to this. Some women, like this woman here, were actually, she's using a Geiger counter to uh, measure the radiation in her milk before she feeds it to her baby. That was actually happening at the time. So that was part of the concern. Uh, it wasn't just about nuclear war, it's about what is all this radiation doing to the health of the planet and, the, and its people. So uh, this group uh, did a lot of work they, they, to try to change the policy and try to stop these nuclear tests. Letters and calls, visits to Congress and the President, uh, articles in the newspaper, protests, demonstrations, but they didn't feel they were making such much progress, so they decided to do something more bold. They decided to get a sailboat and sail it right into the nuclear test zone to bring the world, world's attention to uh, this huge problem. That's the boat in those days. Uh, they, they, they headed out from uh, Los Angeles uh, on their way to, first, their first stop was going to be Honolulu. They actually only got out a couple hundred miles when they ran into a terrible gale and uh, one of the crew was extremely ill, so they had to come all the way back to Los Angeles. And they got a new crew member, headed out again, made it to right about here, uh, and uh, they, they had uh, announced their plans to go into the Marshall Islands, into this nuclear test zone, so they made it very public. So the U.S. government issued a rule saying that they, it, was, it would be illegal for them to do so. So when they arrived in Honolulu and then tried to leave the harbor, headed for the Marshall Islands, they were uh, detained by the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard didn't allow the boat to leave and arrested the captain and one of the crew members. And then a, another couple of the crew members tried to take the boat out even while the captain was in jail and make, make a run for it. They got into international waters. They got run down by this, well not run down, but they got apprehended again by a Coast Guard, destroy, uh, Coast Guard cutter here. And uh, they were all uh, uh, prosecuted and ended up doing 60 days in uh, jail in Honolulu, and then, um, but uh, and here's a picture of the crew here, um, and they were uh, very impressive. There's another family, there were sort of demonstrations going on in Honolulu and actually all over the United States mm -hmm. to, to let the Golden Rule sail and to free the Golden Rule. Uh, another family, American family, was in the harbor at that time. This is Alawai Harbor in Honolulu. And just a couple do a couple uh, slips down in their own boat, the Phoenix of Hiroshima. Um, very interesting family. The father, um, Dr. Earl Reynolds, was a medical researcher who had actually been doing work on behalf of the U.S. government studying the effects of radiation on children uh, in Hiroshima after the nuclear blast. Um, and uh, his uh, Research was classified so high he wasn't able to see it himself. <laughs> um, and he was very angry about this. Basically, he felt the government was suppressing the research and perhaps using it for 
the wrong purposes, that is maybe how to build bigger, stronger bombs or whatever, as opposed to how to take care of these children who've been exposed to radiation. So this family was uh, just two slips down from the Golden Rule and their crew. They met the crew. They went to, the court, to their um, trial in Honolulu. Uh, they saw them stand up and testify courageously, uh, for standing up for what they believed in. They were so inspired, and they already had the experience of being in Hiroshima. In fact, two of their crew people were, from, were uh, Hiroshima. Only one of them is pictured here. The other one had gone back to uh, Japan by then. Um, so they decided that they were going to, the family got together and had a serious conversation, and they said, you know, we really feel called to continue this mission. So they actually, without publicizing it, they left uh, Ali Wai Harbor and sailed into the Marshall Islands. It takes a few weeks to get there. Um, and uh, the, the father was arrested. He was on trial in Honolulu for, for two years. He was convicted. Uh, and eventually that conviction was overthrown because the rule that uh, they disobeyed was unconstitutional. It was a violation of international law because the U.S. had no right to tell anybody they couldn't sail into this huge area of international waters. So, but they got worldwide attention and uh, between the two boats and those prosecutions, they did reach a lot of people. They did educate a lot of people about the dangers of radiation in the atmosphere and they helped build support for the uh, Partial Test Ban Treaty, which was signed in 1963 by President Kennedy and the leaders of the UK and the USSR, basically making it illegal to uh, explode nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, or underwater, or in space. It was still allowed to go on underground. And I, and I read the other day that France and one other of the nuclear powers, which one would it be? actually uh, uh, didn't obey that law for some time. They continued testing in the atmosphere for maybe 15 years more. Uh, so in the meantime, the boat got sold, changed hands, a number of different families that sailed around the South Pacific and also in the Caribbean, and somehow or other ended up on the rugged northern coast of California in Humboldt Bay. and. Uh, it was a, uh, a wreck. In fact, the story is that the boat was owned by this medical doctor who was a uh, specialized in uh, taking care of uh, rock and roll stars. And uh, his nickname was Dr. Feelgood. And, uh, but Dr. Feelgood didn't take good care of his boats. And this one was left derelict floating around the humble bay. Somebody tied it up to a dock loosely and a big gale hit and banged into the dock and big hole in the side and sank. It was pulled out from under the water, and this is what it looked like. It was pretty much a wreck. Um, and there's another, another look at it. But it turns out that the, the bulk of the boat was actually still structurally sound. So the people who pulled it out of the water uh, were going to, and their first uh, idea was they were going to just turn it into a big bonfire, get a bottle of whiskey, and you know, this boat played an important role in the Cold War. You should check it out. So they did check it out, and they found out its history. There were a lot of people interested in the boat, including the Smithsonian Institute. But Veterans for Peace in that area found out about it, and they said, wow, this is a really important uh, piece of history. We want to rebuild it and restore its mission of sailing for a nuclear-free world. And that's just what they did. They asked for one year in the boatyard, and then five years later, uh, and thousands of hours of volunteer labor. They had a restored golden rule. Here they have some of the members of Veteran for Peace putting the engine in. That's what it, uh, it looked like. Um, coming together as a boat. There's this, the launch party in 2015. It was a big deal with hundreds of people from all over the country and even Japan. Our first voyage was to come down the coast to San Diego that was a few, couple summers ago in 2015 uh, for the Veterans for Peace National Convention. We made lots of stops along the way doing educational events. The next year we headed north from Eureka, which is the home port of the boat, and uh, we were in Oregon, Washington State, British Columbia. Lots of uh, interesting events, including four wooden boat shows, 
where we could reach tens of thousands of people and tell them this whole story about the boat and the importance of, uh, of eliminating and banning nuclear weapons uh, before it's too late. Uh, we also had a number of protest actions, out, including outside the uh, uh, Bangor nuclear submarine base, 25 miles west of Seattle. There's a Trident submarine base there with more nuclear firepower than anywhere else in the United States. And hardly anybody knows about it, not even in Seattle, oddly enough. So we had a bunch of people in kayaks. I don't know if you have heard the, the, the new expression for kayak, kayaktivists. These are kayaktivists <laughs> joining us. Um, so we, uh, had, had, we also were lucky enough to re be recognized by some of the local governments and towns we visited. They declared it uh, Golden Rule Day or Week. And uh, um, we uh, accompanied the indigenous canoe journey in the Northwest as a support boat. And uh, made lots of different connections. This last year we came down the California coast again. We, whoops, we, uh, we went to San Francisco Bay, all the way up to Sacramento Delta, here to Sacramento, back out, and then down the way here. We had a special crew member with us from Monterey here to Morro Bay. And that was Ann Wright. That was Yay. A good night out in the water. Wasn't it, it was. <laughs> Actually, it was kind of a, was that rough sailing there? It was a little bit. A little rough that day. <laughs> anyway, we're, right now we're in San Diego, California. We've kind of been wintering there. And we were intending to actually take the boat all around the United States. And we we're going to get to the East, we were going to get to the East Coast a lot sooner. But uh, then when Donald Trump recently threatened to s totally destroy North Korea with fire and fury like the world has never seen, we uh, realized it was time to head for the Pacific. It didn't make sense to be going to the Gulf of Mexico and the East Coast right now. So we're, we made a decision a couple of months ago uh, that we're going to come back to Hawaii and uh, and then we're going to go on to the Marshall Islands, the original journey, uh, original destination in 1958. So the golden rule will be coming back to Hawaii for the first time in 59 years. And that's why I'm here to meet with people, uh, to let them know of our plans and to make, we found so far, we found a lot of excitement. I've been over on the big island, I've been over on Maui, but mainly I've been meeting a lot of people in Oahu. And uh, we're really looking forward to uh, we're going to come, we're going to be arriving here in the late June or early July, and uh, we intend to stay uh, for several months, maybe even to the end of the year, and uh, travel all over the Hawaiian Islands and meet as many people as we can uh, to, uh, all, you know, aside from opposing nuclear weapons, we're also sailing for a peaceful, sustainable future. So where, wherever we go, we try to uh, hook up with the issues that are of most concern to the local communities. Sometimes those are environmental concerns. Sometimes it's a question of human rights and indigenous rights. And so we want to be, and, and of course we found, in, I'm, I'm learning so much being in here, here in Hawaii, my first time in Hawaii. I've been here just a little over a week. And I uh, can't believe how much I've learned and how much I still have to learn. But we, we realize that the connections of militarization um, and nuclear weapons and threats of war, environmental degradation, and indigenous rights, sovereignty issues are all very much interconnected. So we want uh, the golden rule to be part of those, those struggles. Um, this is a peace action camp we did in San Francisco Bay Area with some, some younger uh, folks, uh, teaching them how to sail, as well as issues of nonviolence and nuclear issues today. And that, went, that was really great and had a lot of fun. And we'd like to do some things like that here in Hawaii uh, to connect with students, both young students and older students who would be interested in uh, coming out sailing with us. Don't have to uh, join the Navy to learn how to sail. Uh, <laughs> but here's the Navy. Here's the Navy uh, uh, saluting the, uh, you see all the sailors along the side there? <laughs> saluting the golden rule.
And that happened in, in uh, October in San Diego during Fleet Week and the Navy's Air and Sea Parade. Are you sure about that? Well, <laughs> yeah, it sure looks like it. <laughs> anyway, the truth of the matter is, I thought some of them probably were saluting the Golden Roll, but I think they were ordered to salute the, uh, sh the crowd on the shore, and we just happened to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's our favorite photo, so. We'll yeah, take it's it. great. But actually, you know, we were we received a letter from there's a bunch of ships, Navy ships out there that they we received a letter from a, one of the commanders who was in who was in charge of one of those ships, and he said, "I saw you out on the water there. I was like, I had to swerve a little bit to keep from <laughs> running into you, and." Uh, uh, I was really impressed by what you're doing, and I'm, my, my, I'm almost going to be retired. I'm, I'm looking forward to joining Veterans for Peace. And yeah. we, we thought, oh, Yay. That's <laughs> so that's the kind of response. Actually, we talk, we talk to a lot of the active duty personnel at these fleet weeks, and we get a lot better response from them, oftentimes, than we do from the civilians. Because at least you know, they're interested, and uh, uh, they're glad that we're interested in what they're doing. Because oftentimes they feel like people don't don't know or don't understand what, what their life is about in the military, and certainly better for peace does. So uh, this is uh, kind of where we're going to be going, LA, Hawaii, like I say, we're going to be here for several months, we're going to have a whole lot of fun with a lot of people, we're going to go on to the Marshall Islands, um, probably in time for March 1st, 2019, which is when they celebrate or, or commemorate the big Castle Bravo test. Uh, then we're going to go on to Guam, which has also been turned into kind of one big U.S. military base uh, to a large extent, and the Marianas there. And we're going to go to uh, Okinawa, and uh, which has got some of the same issues. Um, back to Veterans for Peace uh, delegations have been going over to Okinawa the last couple of years to join in the, the local resistance to building yet more U.S. bases in Okinawa. We, uh, we may, uh, we're definitely going to be in Japan in 2020, which is the 75th anniversary of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. And there's a good chance we'll also be going over to Korea, um, Jeju Island and South Korea, and if we get a chance, even North Korea. So our intention is to bring a message of peace and uh, to stand in the way at least symbolically, in the way of uh, the possibility of a, a nuclear war, and uh, so there's some some good. So these are it's a beautiful photo I took of the Golden Roll at the at the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And these are a number of different ways that people can volunteer to help uh, help us. We have a good Facebook page you can check out VFP Golden Roll Project, uh, VFP for Veterans for Peace. And we also have a website, same name. Um, and uh, so, you know, we, we talk to people, of course, about the threats today, which obviously, you know, Donald Trump has brought uh, people's attention to the fact that the nuclear war is still a very all-too-real possibility. Uh, we also uh, make people aware of the dangers of nuclear power. And the whole nuclear cycle, the uranium mines, there's 15,000 uh, abandoned uranium mines in the United States. And most of them are in the western United States on indigenous lands. And they continue to poison the air and the water. And uh, nobody, hardly anybody's taken any responsibility for cleaning up these mines. So we're involved with the uh, indigenous-led struggle to force the federal government to do just that. Okay, so uh, these are some of the countries where our flashpoints that have the potential for leading to uh, nuclear war. Uh, nuclear posture review, we haven't filled that one out yet, but uh, the U.S. Uh, recently uh, issued new guidelines for its nuclear posture, which basically indicated that they're lowering the threshold for using nuclear weapons. And some of you might have heard that Donald Trump said, well, if we've got them, why don't we use them? And uh, that's kind of his attitude. And, uh, and uh, so what they, they're saying now is we, we would use nuclear weapons uh, potentially even if we were attacked in a, with a non-nuclear attack. Even a cyber attack, a kind of a strategic cyber attack, uh, could be responded to with a first strike nuclear attack by the U.S. And that's the new posture. They're 
that put instead of a, instead of negotiated in good faith to reduce nuclear weapons and eventually uh, get rid of all of them, which all the nuclear powers are supposed to do according to the non-proliferation treaty they've signed. They're supposed to be negotiating to get rid of these nuclear weapons, and instead every one of them, led by the United States, is actually modernizing them, building new ones. The U.S. plans to spend a billion dollars, excuse me, a trillion dollars, that's more than a billion, um, over the next 30 years to uh, modernize its, its nuclear weapons. So uh, the good news is that the world is uh, paying attention and taking responsibility, even, even if the nuclear powers are uh, not. And uh, on July 7th of this last year, the United Nations General Assembly overwhelmingly voted to uh, support the treaty. 122 countries approved it. One, only one country voted against it, basically banning nuclear weapons. UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And once it's ratified by 50 countries, which it will be soon, it becomes international law. And uh, unfortunately, the uh, as I said, the nuclear powers, there's nine countries that have nuclear weapons, and uh, none of them participated in these treaty negotiations. But they'll be feeling the heat. This is the will of the people of the world being expressed here, and uh, it's going to be a really strong tool to pressure uh, the United States and all the other nuclear powers to, uh, to reduce and eventually eliminate their nuclear weapons. Also this year, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. So it's a very strong recognition of the importance of this work and encouraging us to do more and better to finally bring an end to nuclear weapons, which can be done and will be done. Uh, and uh, these are some of the things. There's a bill in the Congress right now called the Markey Liu Bill, which, is, which would require a congressional declaration of war before the president could uh, issue a could uh, could uh, strike first with nuclear weapons. So the little tools like this that people are trying to at least curtail the possibilities of an actual, of the U.S. actually initiating the nuclear war. Um, these are some of the issues with nuclear power. Um, nuclear power, among, aside from being very unsafe and a very expensive way to boil water, is also produces plutonium that's needed to build nuclear bombs. So if you get rid of nuclear power, then you're also going to be getting rid of nuclear bombs. Nuclear waste. So, um, let's see, that, that's it. So these are the, the website here. These are, I know some of you are, I've heard some of you are like, you know, very well to do. So <laughs> you can send donations to this, uh, this PO box here. But anyway, check us out. Check, check out the uh, website and even more the our Facebook page and stay in touch and uh, we're looking forward to coming back here with the golden rule so you won't just have to listen to me talk you can act actually come on we're gonna we want to bring the golden rule right here to how do you say why not why and I why and I I just like I said I've been here a week I haven't mastered the, the Hawaiian names yet by any means I'm in trouble with it yeah we're gonna come to why and I we're just over there in the harbor this afternoon looking at good places to dock the boat and we'd like to stick around here for a little while and take people out sailing with us and, and uh, make you part of the Golden Rule family. So thank you and so I'd, we're really interested to hear your your feedback, your comments, your questions. I know you got some. <laughs> I can tell you got one. <laughs> uh, so what do you think? Are any of you sailors? Because we're actually going to be looking for some sailors. Experience, no experienced sailors here? We'll have to change that. Who wants Who wants to become a sailor? There you go. <laughs> well, this is a great opportunity. If you've not been out sailing before, that we can take you out and bring your families along. And uh, we hope to be doing all sorts of educational things about uh, the whole issue of nuclear weapons and what's going on in the world. So... We look forward to you all being a part of it. Yeah. So I imagine you haven't had a whole lot of occasion to think deeply about the 
threat of nuclear weapons, but did this, this recent uh, false alarm, did that kind of shake any of you up? Give you, give you something to think about? What did you think about it when all of a sudden on your phone you saw this message, take cover, nuclear attack going? There's two parts to it though. One is the, uh -huh. uh, was the phone message. The other one normally you have the alarm go off. Yes. The whistle, well, the whistle didn't go off out here. And the and whistle didn't go off. The text message yeah. part, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I figured it. What did you have to say back there? Um, I was just, my reaction was I looked straight to the sky to see if I could see because normally when you get something like that, it's, it's inevitable. It's like 20 minutes or so mm -hmm. of the distance. So I was just looking and then, but just being on the road, you can see the panic. Mm -hmm. People were taking, they were 60, 70 miles an hour on a 30, trying to get the families, you know, and there were cops around, but the cops didn't stop because they were, they, they were more understanding because of that. You know? Yeah, they probably wanted to get home to their families, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, if there were a nuclear war, I guess Hawaii and as a lot of other places in the United States would be a target, not because uh, Russia or China or North Korea have anything against Hawaiians, but because there's so much U.S. military, strategic military presence here. In fact, I, I can hardly believe, I mean, you know, there, there's, there's U.S. military bases in many places in the United States. You see quite a bit, but I can't believe how much is right here uh, in Oahu. And as well as the other islands, it just seems like it's like way over the top. And they're still bombing. They're still bombing with live fire over on the big island. Mm -hmm. And I understand you have a whole lot of unexploded ordnance right here nearby. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 And it's, uh, so uh, Hawaii would be a lot safer place if the military wasn't here. <laughs> But it will also be a lot safer place if we can reduce uh, international tensions and start to build trust among nations and, and uh, start to uh, reduce and eventually eliminate all nuclear weapons. And I, you know, as I said before, Veterans for Peace has, our goal is to actually abolish war. And some people think, well, that's pretty, uh, that's very idealistic kind of utopian dream, it doesn't sound too practical, and uh, I even had that reaction when I first heard it, but I, the, more I, the more I think about it, though, I don't, I think it's, it's going to be necessary, in large part because of nuclear weapons. I think if you're going to abolish nuclear weapons, you're also going to be abolishing war, um, and just building a whole climate of international trust so that countries don't feel that they have to uh, uh, dominate one another. and. Uh, and constantly be building up their defenses against one another, uh, because one, otherwise, one of these days, you know, that that accident that happened with the text message, that's that's going to actually happen with a, nu a nuclear weapon, which actually has happened several times. We've come really close to accidental nuclear wars, and unfortunately, in, on those occasions, there was like one individual who was thinking, you know, I'm not sure if this. We really do have incoming nuclear weapons. I'm not going to push this button right now. And uh, there's like three or four occasions where that occurred, where some conscientious individual was the person that was between nuclear war and uh, its opposite. So we've been lucky so far. I think it's, I mean, uh, the, only, the only bombs that have been dropped uh, on people were the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. Well, that is, of course, unless you count the Marshall Islands, <laughs> yeah. where they, they kicked people off of the island, and the Bikini Island, and, and started dropping bombs on their territory. And the people in the Marshall Islands are still suffering from very high cancer rate and the destruction of their homelands. And now, uh, to make matters worse, they're getting hit by climate change because the seas are rising and they're losing more and more of their island. Uh, so, uh, but. Uh, Still, we've been very, it's, it's kind of a miracle that there hasn't been a nuclear, it wasn't a nuclear exchange between the Soviet Union and the U.S. during the Cold War. 